everybody. Welcome to the Jasmine Ballroom. We have uh, brute forcing lockdown hard drive pin codes here with Colin O'Flynn. I have a few things to say before we actually get started here. To start off with, start off at the business hall located at Bayside AB during the rest of the day for the welcome reception, basically from now until 1900. The Black Hat Arsenal is going on at the Palm Foyer on level three. And join us tonight for the Pony Awards in Mandalay Bay, BCD at 1830. Everybody, if you can make sure your cell phones are silent, appreciate it. Colin? All right. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, thanks for sticking around to the end here for my presentation on attacking these lockdown hard drives. So I hope you um, learn a little bit about how the drives work. And this presentation was really supposed to be about, you know, reverse engineering them. How do you validate the security of them? And along the way, a sort of quick little mini hack. Um, I'm behind a project called Chip Whisper, uh, which if you haven't seen before, it'll be at Arsenal tomorrow at some point, like 4 p.m. or something like that. Um, but you can come check it out. It's sort of an open source tool for doing all sorts of side channel power analysis and glitching. So these are sort of more advanced uh, types of hardware hacking attacks where we're really looking at what a device is doing on a lower layer. All right, so what's this presentation about? Um, this presentation is about a certain type of AES-256 encrypted, as all the marketing material was keen to point out, hard drive. Um, and the specific one I'm looking at is this guy right here. Um, so this is a lockdown brand, or lockdown was the, the name of this, this particular drive. Um, it didn't have any sort of FIPS rating or anything like that. So there's a few different versions of very similar looking drives you'll see, but they differ drastically internally. Um, so for example, there are some that have some uh, rating, FIPS 197 ratings. Um, so there's a few manufacturers of this. I'm not looking at this type of hard drive. Um, I'm specifically looking at these sort of slightly lower end ones. Uh, but unless you really look into it, you may not even notice uh, the full difference between them. And the specific drive I'm looking at, there's quite a few that use a similar internal structure, and that's what we'll dig into a bit when we say, you know, we don't want to break just one specific manufacturer's drive, we want to look at a whole bunch of different ones. And so this also came about when I picked up the drive, um, I found there was some other work that people had done on a different drive, but it used the same internal chipset. So this is when you start finding out, oh hey, this chip is used in a whole bunch of places. Um, so Zarni and Rigo presented last year at Hardware.io uh, this really great paper that dealt with, you know, how is the firmware loaded? How is the drive itself work? Uh, so basically what happens is that the, they found out that when you have these enclosures, you put a drive in, you hit the special like format it button, um, and that's writing some, some data to the drive that helps decide how to encrypt the drive and stores the information about the keys. So they did a ton of work on that. I'm extending it uh, a little bit and also presenting a new attack. All right, so the first part is just the brute forcing. This is like the, the easiest attack and it only works against this specific drive, uh, but it gives you an idea of, you know, what's the easiest hardware hacking type attack we can do. Um, so in this case, what I did is I ripped apart the drive and unfortunately I don't have a good photo of it not destroyed like this and we'll get into why in a moment here. And basically what you can see is the hard drive is on the bottom here and it's plugged into the, the main board is the little green board on the left there. Um, and so that's the USB to SATA board that was inside the enclosure. Um, what I've done is there's a little uh, flash chip over here that I've desoldered from the board and sort of made, made into a, a uh, daughter board that can plug in. So this lets me modify it a lot easier than if it was on the board. Um, there's an LCD to the top part here, uh, and so this LCD is where it displays status information, asks for the pin code, stuff like that. Um, and finally, there's a little header underneath the LCD that you can't really see, uh, and where this header plugs into is the front panel board here. Um, so this front panel board, if you go back to the, this photo, um, you know, is where it has all these buttons that you're pressing and stuff like that. So that's sort of the user interface for entering your pin code. Um, and on this front panel board, there's just a little I squared C capacitive touch sensor. Um, so what this means is it's just detecting where you're pressing, what buttons you're hitting, and reporting it back to that main board. Uh, and this is done over a little tiny header here. And I didn't have a cable that fit that, so you can see I soldered this huge cable onto it. 
Um, and this basically means you know you can have the drive open, you can tap it and see see what it's all doing. Um, so if we sort of break it apart, this is what it looks like. There's a that main chip, that MB86311A. Um, inside this, it's an ARM Cortex M3, so it's a little 32-bit microcontroller, um, nothing too fancy, but it's a fairly well-known microcontroller core. Um, inside it, there's an AES peripheral, so this is where it does the encryption and decryption of your drive. And basically, if things are working normally, you have your hard drive here, it gets connected through this AES peripheral out to the USB. Um, so the only thing that the drive needs to work is what the encryption key should be for that AES peripheral. Uh, and to get that, it has this I squared C bus, so it's gonna ask you for a pin code um, on that front panel. Uh, if the pin code matches what it expects, it loads the AES key uh, into that peripheral. It also is an LCD bus on the, that's hanging off, or an LCD that's hanging off the I squared C bus, sorry. And so everything's communicating over this one bus. Finally down here, this little spy flash, that's that chip that I had pulled off and had on a separate board. So this chip stores the firmware that's running. So this is the code running inside that Cortex M3 device here. Um, and it's basically telling the chip, hey, how do you actually generate the AES key? So this is really critical uh, because if we knew exactly how it was generating the key from the pin code, we could do a lot faster attacks on this, uh, on this board. But the first attack I, I thought of trying was just um, basically emulating this keypad here. So we have a keypad. We could say, well, why don't we manually see how quickly we can put in pin codes? And there's a delay, you know, it's not a completely terrible product. And so if you put the wrong pin code in three times, it locks out for either 30 seconds or a minute or something like that. Uh, but what we can do is you can find a data sheet for uh, the chip or a similar version of the chip. And you can see there's this reset pin here. Um, and so we're gonna try using that reset pin and just to bypass the delay. Uh, when you, I was looking at the device operating, it seemed like it never wrote the current value of the delay to the non-volatile memory. So what this means is that I can get a little development board. I'm using an Atmel dev board. Uh, you could use an Arduino, you could, could use anything else that lets you do sort of basic I squared C communication. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wait for the device to pull the front panel. So it's gonna say, you know, has any buttons been pressed? I'm gonna feed in my guess and I'm gonna see if that worked. And you can see there's some code that I've pushed to GitHub uh, that does this on the Atmel dev board. And it has sort of comments on what pins you would hook up if you want to try that. And this is what you end up with is once you release the reset, um, it initializes the LCD, which happens after about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds. There's a bit of a delay basically where it's spinning up the drive. Um, it has to read some data from the drive. After that's done, it then starts pulling for button presses. So unfortunately, it's not super fast after reset to come out, so this will limit how quickly uh, we can actually do this particular brute force attack. But it does mean that because the timeout's not stored in non-volatile memory, it's pretty easy to bypass. Um, there's a reasonable entry speed in force, but you know, it, within half a second, you can put in four or five digits at least. Uh, so it's pretty quick for the brute force attack. The main issue is this boot involves about 1.5 seconds of delay. It's also possible to reduce this, so if you mirror the drive to an SSD or things like this, you can improve the speed. Um, but even on sort of the worst case scenario, what you end up with is, you know, if it, they're only using a four digit pin, the drive accepts between four to eight digits. Uh, you can brute force it pretty quickly, six hours. Again, this boot delay is killing you. Um, five digits you get into days. Beyond that, it's pretty unreasonable. Uh, so that was sort of the, the initial attack on the brute forcing of the drive. Uh, but it does show if someone just picked up your drive off the ground, it would be pretty easy for them to uh, figure out the pin if it was only a four or five digit pin. Now, I mentioned that I don't have any not ripped apart drives, and that's because when I went to order one in July in Amazon Canada, which doesn't have as much as your amazing Amazon here, um, they said, you know, we got it in stock, don't worry. I ordered a bunch and they just canceled the order. And since then I haven't been able to find it basically anywhere. Um, so I think it may have been discontinued, which sort of made the, the brute force attack interesting, but not really relevant to this uh, or to future. 
So the more interesting part is looking at, okay, let's look at the actual chip and see how secure is that. Because if we can figure out errors in this particular chipset, it's not just this one drive, it's any using, using this type of chip. Um, so the previous work, as I mentioned, Zerni and Rigo, uh, they said that the security is basically a failure and they were using a different manufacturer's enclosure. What they did is they took a drive that had been encrypted in one drive uh, in one enclosure and moved it to another enclosure. And that second enclosure decrypted it fine. So this means all the secure information is stored on the hard drive. Um, this means that if you can figure out what's in the chip, uh, you should be able to just decrypt any hard drive you're given without having any issues at all. And now the only problem, the only thing that they could have done to prevent that, that this test wouldn't actually prove, is that there could be fuse bits inside the device and they could be manufacturer specific. So every uh, in drive enclosure programs some special key into the, into the chip and it, you know, it won't work if you moved it to different manufacturers, um, you, you'd have to guess those or figure out what those key bits were. So this would be a reasonable step, but it's not done. So I bought a gray market chip off AliExpress, um, swapped it in, and it, the drive worked fine. Uh, so there's nothing manufacturer enclosure specific inside that chip. Uh, any, any of them are using the same, the same hardware. Uh, so the next thing is to understand the firmware file itself. Um, so again, from Zerni and Rigo, they figured out that there's basically a stream cipher. Um, what I'm showing here is this is two files that are a different version of the firmware. And in red is bytes that differ, in white is bytes that are the same. So you can see there's only a handful of differences. The first sort of 32 bytes are all different. Um, and then it's very constant. Later on the f in the file, you get more differences but this is like the boot code and stuff that would be as expected constant between, um, between versions. So because this is a stream cipher, basically it means we have a key stream uh, that's either generated from some cipher in a predictable manner or a one-time pad, something like that. Uh, and it's XORed with the original firmware file. And this results in our cipher text. What this means is you can even compare between um, different manufacturers. So these are two different manufacturers of enclosures using the same chipset, different board designs, everything. It's not just the same boards in it. Um, and again, we see a lot of similarities. Uh, the initialization code at the beginning here must be all the same. So they're probably using some SDK that's, that's showing them how to build this. The only other sort of question is um, what is this file? We'd like to be able to modify it a bit to start hacking on this device. So one thing you can see when you sort of look at the file, the first about four bytes or one word, this is a 32-bit device, appears to be like a length. There's a, there's a hex length that matches almost exactly how much data there is. Um, there's a few bytes that are sort of con all zeros and then with one or two bits set, that seems to be a flag byte. Um, and there's still those 32 bytes at the beginning that we'll get to. What we also see, so this is um, a standard Cortex-M3 core. Uh, on the left is just a code I've built for an M another M3 core. Um, and one of the things is right at the beginning of the file, we have a bunch of these interrupt vectors. Um, on this uh, M3 device, there's four words that are reserved and will always be zero. So if you look in any M3 uh, firmware file, you'll see a bunch of zeros. Um, so you probably can't see the zeros, but that's this little block here of words that's all zeros. Now if you look in the firmware file, the encrypted firmware file, uh, what you end up seeing is that there's a block down here. If you can see me sort of highlighting it. Um, it's not zeros, but it's constant. Every version of the firmware you look at between different manufacturers, um, those three byte, those four words are always the same. Uh, we then see some words that vary, and then another block of words that are the same. Um, or sort of two, two words that vary, and then another block that's the same. And this is what we'd expect because we have four here, um, those are zero, we have two that vary, and then one more that's zero, uh, that vary. So this basically tells us right away um, this is direct uh, ARM Cortex M3 code. 
and it's just encrypted with a stream cipher. So there's nothing else involved in this. Um, if we break the stream cipher, we will then be able to reverse engineer what the actual process is to generate the encryption keys on the drive. So to do this, or to sort of start to do this, this part's ongoing, so the previous part was a really simple type of brute force attack, and now we're looking at how could we make a better brute force attack. Um, and really the answer is just how can we sort of validate the security of it. So I'm using something called power analysis, um, and what this is, there's, I've done a bunch of other presentations on this, but very briefly, as you set bits on the data bus, it has some relation to the power consumed by the device. So if more bits are set on the data bus, you end up uh, seeing a larger spike in power at a very small instant in time uh, compared to no bits are set, so they're all zero on the data bus. And this works very well, so you may not believe me, but uh, this works extremely well for breaking encryption, for determining what a device is up to, and all sorts of things. So to do this, I have that chip, um, and I'm basically gonna do power analysis with a little resistor here. Um, I feed the data into my hardware for doing measurement. Um, at the same time, so this is the, the flash by flash memory that we talked about earlier. So this is all the firmware for the device. Um, it's gonna load that firmware into the device. I can watch what it's doing while I change what sort of firmware is loaded. Uh, to do this, basically I take the chip, this is the, uh, uh, the de bottom side of it, and there's a bunch of little wires soldered onto it, so this was before I made a dev board. This was sort of the late night project. Um, and that chip is down here somewhere, so you can't really see it in this photo, but that was, you know, this little dead bug style chip there. Um, we're triggering on some pattern that we're gonna look for um, with the scope at the top. Uh, we do the power analysis here, so that was the chip whisperer project, and there's a bus pirate that can reprogram the flash memory. So what do we start to see? Um, beginning, I have the file, I've modified it a tiny bit to make it an invalid file. Looking at the data sheet for the MB86C311A, that chip, uh, it says, you know, oh, by the way, we use a verification of the firmware, we have a signature on it, and it's encrypted. So I knew there should have been some sort of verification uh, and the problem was I had to know, is it decrypting it first and then checking the signature, or is it checking the signature first and then decrypting it? So to help answer that, I used power analysis um, to really directly see what it's up to. So this is the, what the power trace on the top in green looks like. Um, so this guy here is the power trace. And the bottom is the spy traffic. And so basically there's a big chunk here where it's loading the data. Um, so that's not really of interest. There's that delay at A where it's doing something um, and then it writes some stuff to the spy flash and sort of keeps going. Now, in the other case, where I have a valid firmware that works fully, we see something very different. So you see right away we go from a, having that uh, little function A, it does something new at B um, and also at C. But this big jump at C, you know, we don't know exactly what it is, but this we could make a guess is the verification of the signature, or the decryption, sorry, uh, because it's always gonna verify the signature, only if the signature correct is it gonna do the decryption. So we assume this is decryption. Uh, so they both complete A, only the vo valid code completes B, um, and probably C is, you know, switching to the regular operating code, maybe powering on SATA or something like that. Um, so what is that operation exactly is the question now. Uh, one way we can confirm this is I've written FFs at that location in the firmware file where I know it should be don't cares, or it should be reserved, so it shouldn't really matter. Um, I can then look at the power as the device is doing this operation. And this is like what the, so the raw power, you see that same sort of thing. There's a bunch of spikes here. That's not very interesting. Uh, what's more interesting is a differential trace. So this is the device, um, the difference in the power consumption when it's operating with FFs in some position. So the blue trace is when the first uh, word is all FFs. The red trace is when the second word is all FFs. And you see a few things right away. You see A, there's like a, a tiny 
sort of delta between the first two peaks. Uh, so this is suggesting, you know, there's a big for loop that's doing this, uh, whatever this operation is. The second thing we see is that there's, you know, multiple locations where it seems to be dealing with this data. So it's not just dealing with it once, um, which would suggest perhaps decryption, but instead it's dealing it with multiple times. So it's some sort of operation with, you know, like a feedback, um, because maybe it has some delay elements that's sending the data through, um, XORing it with something and sending it back here, something like that. Um, and so this right away suggests that it's a hash operation. Um, and so now the question is, what is that hash? And I basically made a small Python script that just imported from Hashlib what algorithms it knew of, that way I didn't need to know about them, um, and just tried various sort of variations of it. And the, at the bottom part, there's this starts with, so that was the known, these first um, 32 bytes, I guess, if I go back here, these first 32 bytes, I guess, were probably a hash. So this was for one, for one firmware file, I just said, well, let's look if hashing various areas of the, the file generates um, this. And that actually worked. Um, so then I was able to figure out, okay, we can now generate uh, a hash with SHA-256 of the firmware file, and it'll accept it, and now it'll decrypt the file. So the ongoing work is actually breaking that decryption. Um, right away, we can cause it to, to load arbitrary code. It's not necessarily decryptable yet, uh, or it's not something that we can definitely cause it to load, you know, a specific operation, like let's load a memory dumper. Um, but we can, with this, we can now start to investigate that decryption code, because it can now decrypt arbitrary code, not just valid code. And so doing the same sort of power analysis, uh, what I've done, and the red and blue traces are the differential traces. In blue, we again have the case where the first 512 bytes um, are all FFs minus where they're all zero. So Anywhere it's, it's dealing with, you know, byte zero through 511, there's a sort of a larger blue spike. So we see a larger blue spike. Um, in cyan near the bottom is the actual power trace. Um, and you sort of see it, it does some sort of load on the input data. There's a big spike. Uh, and then there's another little operation, which I assume is unloading or writing it uh, somewhere else in memory. And then it deals with the, ne the next block, so the next 512 bytes. Um, so right away we can get an idea of where it's decrypting it, but we still need to figure out uh, the exact algorithm at this point. Um, it may be that they're using you know, the AES hardware crypto in the device as some sort of stream safer, which wouldn't be unreasonable and would explain this large uh, peak here. But, but it is useful enough that we can cause arbitrary uh, code to be decrypted. Um, you could try moving around the reset vectors quasi-blindly, uh, so that is, you know, you can flip bits at least because we can now cause any sort of modified code to be signed and loaded okay. Um, and if we could determine even just a part of the stream cipher um, or part of that code, so if we could figure out, for example, what init routines are being used there, they're probably fairly standard, um, you could build a short dumper program. So if you could fit a program that simply reads out memory and dumps it in that first little um, constant section, you may be able to get access to the code that way. But fundamentally, the problem is that there's no secrets uh, stored inside that MB86311 device. So they didn't have any sort of manufacturer-specific fuse. Or if they did, it seems like most people weren't using it. And again, that's because I was able to swap the devices. Um, almost all the devices seem to use the same, that same firmware keystream seems to be the same. Uh, and it's even used in, there's a version without uh, AES that's used in the PlayStation 4, uh, and it has the same sort of, you see the same pattern in the firmware. So it means any company using these devices could decrypt the firmware from another company. Um, and once that's known, basically everything is lost. So if you're asking, you know, how secure are these hard drives? Um, number one, you definitely can brute force them in a you know, reasonable amount of time for four or five digits, but more critically, there could be someone out there who's able to uh, read this firmware, and you know, there's many companies that make these drives, many companies that would have access, presumably, to this stream cipher, and then once you have that, it's sort of all lost. Um, and we also have flaws in the 
uh, the firmware itself, due to the fact it just uses that SHA-256, I think, um, it would have it would have been preferable such that there's you know some sort of signing operation that required me to guess a secret key. That that's what I really um, I really would like to see. But I'm able to sign sort of any firmware I load on the device. So that's sort of a summary of the the brute forcing um, of the basic pin code, and then how I'm starting to analyze the actual security of the firmware itself. So I know it's a kind of quick presentation, but thanks for sticking around. And if you have questions on any aspects, I'd be happy to take them.